Hello everyone, thank you for checking out my YouTube channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Peter Purton. Some of you are going to be familiar with his work, especially on medieval military history, and I can honestly say the fact that he's coming on here today truly humbles the study of antiquity in the Middle Ages. Dr. Purton, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, Nick, hello, and uh, hello to all those who are going to be listening shortly to, to what I have to say today. And I have to say it's a pleasure for me to to reach out to uh, to your audience, which I'm sure is is full of people who are deeply interested in the, in the study of history and uh, maybe haven't had the opportunity in their in their lives and careers to give it as much attention uh, as they'd like as they'd like to. I'm someone who's been deeply interested in the subject of history since since I was very young. Um, I think probably uh, I blame my mother <laughs> for um, my early fascination with medieval castles because I understand when I was uh, too young to know otherwise that she pushed me in a pram around Warwick Castle in the Midlands in England, which is one of the splendid late medieval sites uh, that one can visit in this in, in this country, which is full of, full of such medieval relics. Um, in my early days, I, I pursued that interest with a, a friend at school. We read the books that the local library had on the subject um, and copied them out, essentially. We didn't do our own research. Uh, <laughs> and later on, we discovered that, or I discovered that um, you can't really do it this way. Uh, you need the knowledge of your predecessors, um, but they always do it within a particular framework. And unless you understand the framework, you miss out part of the subject. Later on, I, 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 did, I went to Oxford University. I studied history at Oxford. I got a very good degree uh, and then went on to do doctoral studies and got a, got a PhD, as we call them at Oxford. Um, and um, that wasn't, in fact, in medieval history. That was in early modern Dutch history. Mm. Um, after that, um, my career path went in a different direction. And I spent most of my life until I retired, which was nearly five years ago now, uh, working as a trade union officer for the British Trade Union Confederation, the TUC. Uh, but throughout that time, I maintained my interest in, in and got more interested in studying medieval history. And I began my research on um, medieval siege warfare and uh, medieval castles t some 20 odd years ago now. Um, and uh, all my weekends and my holidays would be spent either in uh, the major British libraries, uh, reading the, the source material uh, and uh, or, or visiting castle sites. Increasingly, as uh, my resources increased and my salary went up, I was able to extend those trips abroad because I think it's one lesson is uh, if you're going to study medieval history, there is simply no sense in attempting to do it within the boundaries of a modern nation state because they didn't exist as right. such in medieval times. One can only understand, for example, the history of England if you also understand the history of Normandy and of much of France. Um, you can only understand the history of castles if you understand not only the histories of uh, French and English castles, but also those were, that were built in the Middle East during the Crusades and so on. So uh, I spent a lot of time and work going into that. Uh, the siege warfare books were published eventually. Uh, it took a long time to write them, only having weekends, in uh, 2010. Um, since then, I've done further work and uh, written a, a more specialist uh, focused text uh, on the subject of military uh, medieval engineers. Um, because um, when you study the castles and the sieges, you become aware that um, it wasn't actually the kings and princes and dukes and counts who did the, the daily work to make these things happen or who built the castles in the first place. Uh, it was ordinary people, craftsmen, artisans, uh, and uh, they applied their skills also to engineering. So that's why I wrote that book, which came out now a couple of years ago. And um, I would be doing more research at this very moment uh, in Europe. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that we're all in lockdown yeah. and uh, travel is barred. So um, gave me the opportunity to prepare this paper to present to you today. The title of this lecture is King John and the Great Siege of Rochester, 1215. It should last about 40 minutes. 
between Tuesday the 13th of October and Sunday the 30th of November 1215, the city and castle of Rochester in Kent in southeast England was captured by King John's army following an epic siege, one of the greatest in English history. It attracted the attention of many contemporary chroniclers as well as that of later historians. For the modern tourist, the fate and the critical function of 40 fat pigs naturally attracts much attention, given their part in bringing down the corner of the Great Tower and leading directly to the castle's fall, this is understandable. But the detailed evidence that is unusually available for this siege is also instructive in demonstrating many of the elements of a large-scale medieval siege, as well as revealing contemporary attitudes to warfare, chivalry, loyalty and rebellion, and human life itself. In 2015, the Castle Studies Group, an organisation of archaeologists, historians and amateur folk sharing an interest in all aspects of medieval castles, organised a conference in Rochester to mark the 800th anniversary of King John's siege, coinciding with an exhibition to mark the event in the city's Guildhall. This lecture is based on a paper I gave there. I was pleased to acknowledge the help that I'd had from the late Derek Wren and from Richard Dunn, director of the nearby Royal Engineers Museum in Chatham. Between local antiquarians, archaeological and historical studies, and contemporary medieval accounts and records, we can reconstruct what happened that autumn with remarkable reliability. But there remain many gaps in the surviving records that have not been resolved through archaeology. This is an attempt to plug those gaps with hypotheses that agree with the evidence and are consistent with contemporary techniques technology and ways of thinking. First though, it's important to understand the context in which these events took place. 1215 is chiefly famous as the year of Magna Carta, the Great Charter. Echoes of the rights set out there, or more accurately, some of them, and from a later reissue of the Charter, have resonated down the centuries, both in reality or as often as myth. The king whose misdeeds led to the Charter was John, the youngest son of King Henry II, who ruled for between 1154 and 1189. John has long been demonised as the worst king ever to rule England. And while some efforts have been made to rehabilitate him, and some other candidates run him close, in truth, he probably deserves the description. He inherited from his elder brother Richard in 1199 a multitude of dominions which he ruled in a personal capacity. As well as being King of England, he was Duke of Normandy, Lord of Ireland, Count of Anjou, and in the right of his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, ruler of what is now southwest France, from Poitou to the Pyrenees. Richard had been a formidable warrior and renowned crusader but he'd also drained vast resources from his kingdom to pay for his adventures and his immense ransom when he fell into the hands of the Austrian duke he had offended on crusade. John, by contrast, was not a great military commander and, ruling over a rather poorer realm, managed to lose much of his parents' inheritance to Philip Augustus, King of France. What he did share with his family was a ferocious temper alternating with calculating cunning and a capacity for great ruthlessness. He was additionally mercilessly vindictive. Now, to succeed, medieval monarchs needed to rule with the support of, not in conflict with, their nobles, who included the leading churchmen. Bishops and abbots were also landowners, commanding great wealth and numerous knights. The church gave kings sacred authority as anointed by God to rule. They provided, too, extensive local government administration and resources. Now, it took a lot of misdeeds to turn all these natural allies against him. But John, by his frequently outrageous behaviour against opponents, real or perceived, and his rapacious demands for money to pay for his failed attempts to preserve his inheritance, managed just that. Long before 1215, many of the barons and bishops of England had lost faith in their king. In 1215, at last, they forced the king to agree to give up his bad practices and return to government with the consent of the ruling class when he put his seal to Magna Carta in June. Now, John was cruel, but not stupid. 
He made his peace with the Pope. He promised to go on crusade, a cause close to the Pope's heart, and got him to nullify his agreement to Magna Carta in August 1215. The opposition ignored this, so the Pope excommunicated the rebels and suspended the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been mediating but actually favoured the opposition. The king had already started raising an army. The barons had compelled John's agreement to Magna Carta at Runnymede at great personal risk, and many nurtured deep grievances against their king, so were in no mood to trust him, rightly as it proved. They too gathered their knights, and both sides ordered the provisioning of the castles they held. So, in the late summer of 1215, there began a civil war. The siege of Rochester was among the first major operations. Why Rochester? The map at figure one shows why this small city had an important strategic role. It lies on the River Medway, on the old Roman road, Rocker Street, from Dover and the Channel Ports, first to Canterbury, seat of England's leading archbishop, then London. It's approximately 26 miles from the first and 35 from the capital. In John's hands, it threatened his enemy's base in the capital and secured his control of Kent and the vital route to the continent. But in theirs, it was a critical outpost and threatened the king's power in Kent and the south. The Romans had built a walled city here, which underlay the medieval settlement and castle, as well as the bridge, which for centuries provided a reputedly hazardous crossing of the Medway, a tidal river with a large difference between high and low tide levels and treacherous and extensive mud flats on the banks, making the bridge an essential communication. Its construction was a typically impressive Roman engineering achievement. The nine deep piles needing constant maintenance, but the roadway was always timber. Its repair was a prime concern of both King and the Bishop of Rochester, who was liable for its upkeep, which had been the case since the Anglo-Saxon period, when the city became England's second bishopric. Although it was possible to cross the river by boat, this was not a method suitable for large numbers of warriors. So once the bridge timbers were burnt or broken up, there was no prospect of anyone reaching the city or castle from the London side. Sadly, one can't see anything of the long-lasting medieval bridge today, because the modern bridge stands in the same place. This figure shows the castle, next to which was built the cathedral and Benedictine priory of St Andrews and the Bishop's Palace, occupying a corner of the old city wall which had been demolished at this point during the 12th century to allow for the extension of the ecclesiastical buildings. There are things we don't know about the castle as it stood in autumn 1215. The plan by archaeological illustrator Jill Atherton shows what was probably there and how the castle and cathedral occupied most of the space inside the city, whose extent was measured by the ancient Roman wall, with east and west gates controlling the road between London and Canterbury, which formed the high street of the city, and still do. There had been an earthen timber castle built here soon after the Norman conquest, probably comprising a lower bailey and a mound, the Mott, surmounted by a timber tower. It was thought for a long time that this had been the raised ground on the southwest of the castle, known as Bowley Hill. It isn't on this plan, because it's now known that this mound, today covered by 18th century houses and gardens, was part of the reconstruction of an outer bailey that took place after the siege we're discussing. The first castle is now thought to have been under the present castle, which was rebuilt in stone after the failure of a rebellion against the conqueror's son, William II, in 1088. The builder was the then Bishop of Rochester, Gundolf, an expert in construction, who also had a hand in the work at the famous keep, the White Tower, of the Tower of London. From 1127, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William de Corbet, began the erection of the Great Stone Great Tower or Keep within the new stone curtain wall, as it stands today. The Great Tower, Keep or Donjon was a formidable statement of power and prestige, which still dominates the skyline as one approaches the city. Here's an image of it. At a height of 125 feet, nearly 38 metres, it's the tallest surviving keep in England, and one of the tallest in the Western world. A square building with turrets at the four corners, 
The keep has its entrance at first floor level, as was normal. It was reached across a movable wooden ramp from a stair to an external gate tower closed with double doors, the structure unfortunately demolished in the 18th century. Across the ramp, another double set of doors gave access to a large chamber where the ticket office now is, which was well lit and had the chapel on the floor above. It was intended as a waiting space before admission to the main part of the tower. This was further protected by a portcullis and double doors. Although undoubtedly the entrance was intended to be a powerful status symbol, it was also strongly defended. And the fact that we will not mention it again, it played no part in the operations of a siege, suggests that John's men preferred the risks of mining rather than trying to get in via the front door. Inside, the tower has three storeys above an unlit basement used for storage. It was well provided with latrines and fireplaces. Chambers for sleeping were made in two of the turrets. The other two contained spiral staircases, one from the basement for services and the other for the elite to get around. Dividing the inner space into two was a large spine wall, as you can see in this image, with doors to allow access through and in its middle, a well which could be accessed from all floors, but only from the north side, something that would play a part in the final hours of the siege. The well reaches 20 metres into the ground and still contains water. The first floor in any great tower provided space for the Lord to dine, entertain or hold court, and more private space was on the floor above. Rochester is unusual in having two upper levels. We can only speculate as to their function. The rich decoration of the stonework confirms they were meant to be of high status, none of which made any difference during the siege. Outside the Great Tower, and we can see the plan again, was an extensive bailey. This large area would have been filled with a great number of buildings common to medieval castles that had numerous functions as well as being defensible in war. There will have been stables, workshops, kitchen, buttery, servery, a hall for administrative and judicial purposes, accommodation, and we know here two, two further chapels. It would have been like a small town in its own right, capable of hosting the large households of both an archbishop and a king, although possibly not at the same time. After the siege, a dividing wall was erected to enclose the area around the keep. Today, it's a public park, and the covering of the ground with great amounts of rubble makes it most unlikely we will ever discover what lies underneath. There does remain one stretch of the original 11th century curtain wall that surrounded the bailey and the great tower in 1215. It's modest in width, four and a half feet, 1.4 meters at the bottom, narrowing to just two feet, 0.6 meters at the top, but over 20 feet, six and a half meters high and with a crenellated top, battlements though what one can see today are 19th century reconstructions. This wall would play an important part in the first weeks of the siege. A key element in the defence of any medieval fortification was the ditch around the outside, and Rochester was no exception on the three sides not facing the river. One can still see the shape of the ditch today, but we do not know how deep or wide it was in 1215 after the encroachments of eight centuries. Nonetheless, it is likely to have been a formidable obstacle, as suggested in Jill Atherton's plan. The question of who owned the castle is relevant here. In a formal sense, every castle ultimately belonged to the crown. In this case, the castle had been founded by the king, who in 1127 granted it to the Archbishop of Canterbury to hold in perpetuity as its constable. During vacancies in that office, the king took over payment to maintain it and the local knights who owed castle guard service there, 60 of them, continued to do so. In 1215, Archbishop Stephen Langton handed it over to the baronial revels rather than the king. <laughs> so this then is the best evidence we have for the position of the castle in late summer 1215. How do we know what happened next? The sources for the events are plentiful and come from both sides of the struggle. The anonymous Histoire des Ducs de Normandie et Roi d'Angleterre was written by an eyewitness serving one of John's captains, 
Roger of Wendover's well-known chronicle is notable for its fierce partisanship. His patron was the garrison commander, William de Albini, and it's full of detail. Ralph of Coggeshall and the Barnwall Chronicle, reproduced by Walter of Coventry, provide vital additional information. They don't always agree, but there is sufficient overlap to construct a likely version of the events. There are also surviving government records. The close rolls of royal correspondence and the remaining fragment of the pike roll for the 17th year of the reign of John, most of which was lost in the chaos of civil war, but the surviving record of government expenditure is vital evidence. John's army consisted of paid professionals. These were men who knew their trade. They were in it for what they could gain, and they knew that dead men enjoyed no profit from victory, although the risks of war do not seem to have held them back when it came to the fighting. It was led by experienced captains, one of whom, Savarec de Molion, son of the Viscount of Tours in western France, was one of the main commanders. He had once been an opponent, but had changed sides and had served John loyally since 1204. His skill and experience no doubt recommended him. He would go on to serve at Damietta, Damietta on the Nile in the Fifth Crusade in 1219, as would some of those defending the castle against him in 1215. Savaric was also a troubadour, which was not fit with the traditional image of these men as violent thugs, even if many of those they commanded no doubt were. John had been recruiting mercenaries from across the Channel, many from his own land of Poitou, but also from the county of Flanders and other places in the Low Countries. A muster roll survives of the Royal Army dated to December 1215, listing more than 420 knights alone. Most of them had been at Rochester. We know the names of many of the captains. Robert and William of Bethune came from Dendermonde in Flanders and were brothers. Baldwin had come from Air. Gautier Biertaus came with 100 knights. Walter Buck, Gerard and Goddeskull of Sochien were from Brabant. Household knights and brothers Geoffrey and Oliver Bouteville brought knights and soldiers from Gascony. Most were from across the seas. The December roll confirms that apart from his household knights, and not even all of them, John could not or did not rely on the loyalty of knights from his English lands. He'd been busy for weeks, and the army probably numbered several thousand men. They would have included, as well as the knights and their squires and retainers, many foot soldiers, crossbowmen, archers and engineers. With the barons holding London, John was cut off from his main treasury, but in Kent, while raising money where he could, he was also in the best place to re receive reinforcements rapidly from across the Channel. His army assembled during August and September. Having left the Isle of Wight, to which he had withdrawn after the rapid breakdown of the peace agreed at Runnymede in June, John travelled to and fro between Dover and Sandwich and was in Canterbury on the 20th of September. Six days later, a storm wrecked the convoy, bringing Hu de Bove with his Flemish soldiers, whose drowned bodies were washed up for days along the coast, to John's great dismay. But many other contingents arrived safely. Meanwhile, Archbishop Langton, having rejected two previous requests by the king to hand over the castle, no doubt aware of the advantage it would offer him, ordered his deputy in the castle, Reginald of Cornhill, to admit the rebel troops that Robert Fitzwalter was bringing from London precisely to deny it to the king. Who were his opponents? Fitzwalter, a minor Essex baron, had become one of the king's leading opponents and had been chosen as marshal of the baronial army. He arrived in Rochester with a strong force on the 20th of September. At this point, the king's forces were still gathering. If Robert was aware of the king's intentions, which presumably he was why he was there, perhaps he was negligent in not doing more to increase the provisions within the castle. With the royal army ready to march, Fitzwalter withdrew to London on the 10th of October and left Rochester in the hands of a substantial garrison commanded by William de Albini, a major landowner 
from the English Midlands, who was Fitzwalter's cousin and a reluctant rebel against the king. Among the knights with him were his son, Odinel, William of Lancaster, William of Ainsford, Thomas de Milton, Osbert and Richard Gifford, and Thomas of Lincoln. Accounts differ as to the total number of defenders, but there is agreement that it was substantial. 60 or 80 or more nobles and knights, who with their retainers will have taken the total of men trained to fight to well over a hundred, who will have all have had several horses requiring feeding. And this was not counting an unknown tally of foot soldiers and archers and crossbowmen, who would actually be the most significant contributors to the first weeks of the siege. Now we don't know what the citizens of Rochester did. A few may have stayed in their homes, but I doubt it. Some may have fled to the country. Others will have decided to take refuge in the spacious bailey of the castle. These would have added considerably to the burden on the garrison's supplies. Roger of Wendover stated that they were already dismayed at the lack of provisions in the castle and requisitioned what they could from the city, although his language implied that they may have left this until warned of the king's rapid approach, which, if it was the case, was However, they must have gathered enough food to last most of the six weeks that followed. But arms, including the critical crossbow bolts and arrows, required professional manufacture. If these were in short supply, this would have had a massive impact on their defensive capability. We'll never know whether the defenders had to ration their use, or whether they could rely on reusing the stones, bolts and arrows shot by their enemies over the walls. But it was, by any reckoning, a large garrison. The king was now ready and began his advance towards Rochester. He was just a couple of miles, four kilometres away, at Gillingham, on the 12th of October. At some point, John had sent a force by the southern route across the Medway at Tunbridge to try to disable the Medway Bridge. The Morton Bailey Castle there, owned by Richard de Clare, Earl of Hertford, another leading enemy of the king, did not stop him. Having reached Rochester from the western London bank of the river, they were held off by Fitzwalter's men, which means it must have happened before he left for London on the 10th of October. On the 13th of October, the Royal Army appeared at the gates of Rochester. John's soldiers broke in immediately, probably through the gates, securing the city while the defenders withdrew into the castle. It may be that the works at the cathedral had rendered the city wall indefensible, but the decision not to attempt to defend them had the immediate consequence that John's men could use the city and cathedral as their base for attacking the castle, sheltered from the autumn weather. The cathedral suffered serious damage from its uninvited occupants, which included a great number of horses who were stabled inside as hostile chroniclers were keen to record as an act of sacrilege. We must assume that among the first things they did was to burn or break up the Medway Bridge. This left John free to press for siege without worrying about his rear, and his men were able to scour neighbouring territory for provisions without the risk of being intercepted, as we're told they did. This was vital. The logistics of feeding a large army in autumn were challenging albeit not discussed in any of the sources or modern studies. It is a fact commonly overlooked in medieval sieges that hunger was as serious a risk to besiegers as the besieged, but there is no suggestion that the king's soldiers, unlike the defenders, went hungry. No account says anything about the weather faced by the two forces now embedded in Rochester, apart from the great storm that did for Hugh de Beauf and his company. Such information that there is on the climate of northwest Europe that autumn suggests the temperatures were below average, but it is probably prudent to assume that normal autumn weather prevailed. Not very cold, but sometimes wet and windy. Certainly nothing to distract the King's army from its task. What happened next? The first days were no doubt spent securing the base and accommodation, but crucially, erecting earth and timber siege works to enclose the castle on the sides not facing the river, to provide shelter for the attackers from the defenders' arrows and bolts. Once that was done, 
the attack would have begun. The besiegers' numbers allowed them to fight in relays to maintain a continuous attack by advancing to shoot arrows and bolts, which would have put a big strain on the defenders but exposed the attackers to the risk of substantial casualties, something which the sources agree did happen. The king also had five stone-throwing engines. The artillery here was the stone thrower known variously as a petrolery, a perrier or a mangonel, operated by teams of people pulling down the ropes at the front to raise the throwing arm held in a frame and release the sling with the missile held in its end. This illustration shows a reconstruction of a stone thrower at Caerphilly Castle in Wales and on the right the engine in use recorded in the bottom right hand corner of a plaque in a church in Carcassonne in southern France. The engines may have been stored at and transported from Canterbury, which served as a major source of supply for John during the siege, possibly in parts, or they may have been made on the spot, which could have taken a few days. There were engineers with the army. Payments were made on the 10th of November to Master Renya, Savarik's engineer, and to Uric, a royal engineer since 1180, who had specialised in siege artillery in the past and is a likely candidate for building or assembling and directing the use of these weapons. Unlike the counterweight trebuchet, still a rarity in Western Europe and which only arrived in England with French Prince Louis in 1215, 1217, these engines had a short range between 80 metres and a maximum of 100, and a limited throwing capacity, normally between 5 and a maximum of 20 kilograms. Such shock would make no impression on the Great Tower. Even against a curtain wall no more than one metre thick at the top, a breach was unlikely. The ballistic force generated by the rope pullers was too little, and the missiles too small to destroy a wall. Rather, their main role was to maim and kill, but we should not ignore as well the psychological effects of bombardment. They were operated in a continuous day and night assault, which might eventually shatter the thinner crenellations on the curtain. If this happened, it made defending the wall much more dangerous. There are two likely locations for the battery, beside or in front of the cathedral, or inside whatever defences had been put up on Bowley Hill. Both fit the maximum range. This figure shows where the siege works may have been and the possible location of the stone throwers. It would be normal for experienced warriors to focus their attack on specific points rather than the entire circuit and the later evidence of the mining operations suggests that John's army would have done just that. Now no account mentions Bowley Hill. Presumably seized by John's men at the start, this raised ground was an obvious place to set up mantlets or shields for protection and to sustain bombardment of the castle with arrow, bolt and stone shot, possibly positioning the stone throwers behind the hillock where they would still have been in range. Both likely artillery sites were still overlooked perilously for their operator. This picture shows the view of the cathedral from the top of the keep which was well within bowshot or crossbow range of the hoarding known to have stood out from the roof level of the Great Tower. This was a standard form of defence at the time, enabling defending archers and crossbowmen to shoot under protection and others to drop stones on an enemy approaching the foot of the wall. These illustrations, in figure eight, show a reconstruction set up at the Count's Castle in Carcassonne and the holes for the supporting beams on the west of the Great Tower. Now blocked, there were also doorways through the parapet, enabling fighters to access the hoarding on the south and west sides of the Great Tower. The barons marched from London, intending to break the siege on the 26th of October, with an army said to be of 700 knights, but no infantry. They gave up after a few miles after reaching Dartford. Quite how they planned to get across the Medway is unclear. But the scorn of the chroniclers for their idleness, feebleness and weak excuses was sharply expressed. The besiegers would certainly have been encouraged by this retreat and the defenders, abandoned, must have been demoralised. Roger of Wendover says they decided to try again on the 30th of November 
and it is perhaps not a coincidence that this was the day the castle fell. We cannot know if John knew their plans and expedited the attack in response. Probably soon after the first fighting around the castle, the king and his generals would have recognised that there would be no rapid capitulation. They also discovered that creating a breach in the curtain by bombardment alone was unlikely. The chroniclers themselves noted how little impact was being made, although the continuous assaults were taking a heavy toll of John's soldiers. Sometime during the operation, and probably towards the end, because the large number of people inside the castle was eating up the supplies at an alarming rate, the commanders of the defence ordered those less able to fight out of the castle. Only the Barnwell Chronicle reports it, but it was not an unusual occurrence and therefore plausible. There was precedent from just a dozen years before when King Philip Augustus had left for local people who had sought refuge in Chateau Gaillard to starve and freeze in the ditches of John's castle in Normandy over the winter of 1203-4 when the English garrison expelled them. This time, if it happened, King John, we're told, had their hands and feet cut off. Sadly, we know he was quite capable of this. The failure to create a breach in the walls left the options of escalade or mining the wall. The first royal order for picks and shovels, as well as other items, had been sent to Canterbury straight after the siege began on the 14th of October. A further large order for all types of tools, weapons and wagons was issued to the barons of the Exchequer on the 6th of November and also called for ladders. But it appears mining was chosen as the main weapon. If, as the sources imply, the capture of the bailey was followed rapidly by the fall of the Great Tower and the ending of the siege, it looks as if this success, the turning point that made the outcome inevitable, must have taken place between November the 23rd and November the 25th. Where the mines were dug has been lost. Suggestions of trenches found below current ground level have proved archaeologically inconclusive. They could have been anywhere along the circuit. It's most likely that these mines took the form of saps, such as that illustrated on this image of a capital from the Castle Museum in Foix in southern France, where miners or soldiers hacked away the base of the wall, inserting props to prevent it collapsing on them, then burnt the props at the decided time, which would collapse the wall above. One chronicle talks of several breaches resulting, suggesting simultaneous saps at separate sites, and of fierce battles as the besiegers forced their way in, resisted vigorously by the defenders. However, this version begs two big questions. Firstly, the attackers must have been able to get across the ditch to mine in the first place. But how was this accomplished? The ditch was deeper and wider than today, and filling it would have taken considerable time, especially under attack from the defenders, arrows and bolts. The time involved in completing this task, the prerequisite for breaching the walls, may be the chief reason why the siege took around 40 days to reach this point. Secondly, the chroniclers report that with the curtain wall breached by the garrison, breached by the miners, the garrison withdrew into the Great Tower. However, the apparent absence of casualties among the defenders, only one knight died apparently, although there is no mention of the lesser folk, contradicts the claim of much hand-to-hand -hand combat and implies that as the sap was being completed, the defenders may have abandoned the bailey without a fight. During these final days of the siege, John sent Robert of Bethune to seize Tunbridge Castle. The Clare's garrison asked for and was allowed to consult their lord, who was in London, and when it was confirmed by messenger they would not be relieved, the castle was yielded without a fight. This was another way that many medieval sieges were concluded, unlike Rochester. John's famous order to Hubert de Burr, the future justice here, to send 40 fat pigs of those least suitable for eating was dated the 25th of November. If they were immediately slaughtered and their fat collected, 
they could have supplied the fuel for burning the props of the mine under the corner of the Great Tower within a day. We're told that the attack on the tower followed immediately on the capture of the Bailey. Miners would have set to work hacking away as much as possible of the massive stone base of the tower, inserting props as they went, working probably from both sides of the angle at the same time. A doyen of castle studies for late Derek Wren pointed out to me that the traditional story of an underground mine is untenable. The plinth around the foot of the keep is unbroken, as this picture shows. Additionally, the foundations of the tower are at great depth and reach down to sit on top of the ancient Roman wall under the castle. An underground approach would therefore have been unprofitable. And with at best progress excavating underground of a metre a day, the time frame doesn't work. So it must have been a surface operation. Before starting, the diggers must have put in place a strong timber shelter to protect them from missiles hurled or shot from 100 feet above. The space in which they worked was really cramped. It's only a few metres between the foot of the tower and the curtain wall. And even if the latter had been undermined at this point, the debris would have remained. It's possible, of course, that it was actually safer immediately under the corner turret as the hoarding did not extend around it. And also possible that the attackers had by now succeeded in burning the hoarding by heat hitting it with fire arrows. The stone throwers could not have reached that height. And defenders would have had to expose themselves to the king's archers and crossbowmen if they tried to lean out to drop missiles or shoot down at the miners who were right up against the wall. We know who some of these diggers were. Although muscle power may have been provided by rank and file soldiers, a team of miners from the Forest of Dean in the West Country were serving with the King. Master miners Ernolf and William Lamb, with 11 miners, were paid between them 12 shillings and 9 pence per day for 150 days service in this year. And the only siege where it is known that mining was involved was Rochester. It was probably the same Ernolf who was paid for his services undermining the castle of Bedford in 1224, demonstrating a continuity of royal service. The other thought is that they all seem to have survived this experience. The mine worked. The gathering wave of sound as the masonry immediately above the burnt props began to crumble and then crashed massively to earth, bringing down half the wall on either side Hundreds of tons of masonry must have resonated over a vast distance and sounded like the crack of doom. This figure, you can see the new masonry inside and outside where the wall had collapsed. But the defenders would have known what was about to happen and they retreated behind the screen wall we saw earlier. Having blocked the passages, they had control of the castle well and must have collected any remaining supplies on their side of the tower. But once the smoke had cleared, John Goodall has pointed out the evidence that there had been severe burning inside the Great Tower for which the siege is the only possible cause, and the collapsing masonry had come to rest, the King's men could enter via the fallen corner across the rubble and wait for their enemies to review their now rather limited options. Well, surrender followed on the 30th of November. The knights had eaten their horses. A chronicler sarcastically commented how this change to their usually fine diet must have hurt their stomachs. But they had nothing left and surrendered at the king's mercy, a quality in short supply. The king's instinct, having lost many soldiers and spent prodigious amounts of money, was predictably to hang them all. But Savarek de Molion and other captains pointed out that this would set a dangerous precedent and that John's soldiers would not fight for him if they faced the same fate if captured by his enemies. The king saw the sense of this and limited his retribution to one crossbowman who had previously served him since youth, sending the captured knights off to imprisonment in Corfe and Nottingham castles and giving the ordinary soldiers to his men to ransom. 
So ended the great siege. In the immediate aftermath, John was strong enough to divide his army into two separate forces to operate independently in the south and the north. The baronial opposition, stunned by the loss of Rochester, had already offered the crown of England to Louis, son of King Philip Augustus. His arrival in the spring with an army temporarily reversed the balance of power and sustained the civil war that did not end until after John's death in October 1216 and, ultimately, the recognition of his child son as King Henry III. The new king eventually turned his attention to repairing the castle, so resolutely held for so long against the large experienced army gathered by his father, and eventually brought down not by those who made their living from killing, but rather by men who dug the soil for metals. By piecing together nuggets of incidental information in the contemporary sources, and by suggesting the key steps that had not been explained, such as the challenge of crossing the ditch, it has been possible to propose a plausible sequence of events. It is, of course, no more than hypothesis, but hopefully one that stands up and enables a fuller understanding of the great siege of Rochester. Thank you for listening. That's fantastic. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching the presentation today. As you watched, we explored the political background to the Siege of Rochester, the days building up to it, the manpower, the supplies, the dangers of crossing the English Channel, and we finally get to the siege itself and the outcome. But what I really enjoyed most about this was seeing how the ordinary worker – these non-combatants are able to, with their skills of hard labor and working with the earth and their natural elements, are able to change the medieval battlefield to the benefit of the siegers. Dr. Purton, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you.